very much for coming to the comparative literature uh, lunch on lecture series. Believe it or not, today is the next to the last complete lunch on and uh, talk in, in, in this semester. And next week's speaker for the lunch on would be Fon Sosi at the University of Chicago. And he will speak on beginning bioinformatics or the translation of translation. And please come to the, the lunch on next week at around noon. As you may know, we have a big award ceremony before Hon uh, Sosi's talk. And for the events in this week, tomorrow in the Foster Auditorium at 12 p.m., Lucy Malski at the Northeastern University will speak on the architectural legacy of fascism in Portugal, Italy. And tomorrow evening at 5 p.m. in 102 River, uh, Kustov Suzuki will speak on the Borderland Foundation. And on Wednesday at 11.15 in 012 Cuts. Paul Pillar at Georgetown University will give a lecture on why America misunderstands the world. And on Thursday at 12 noon in 102 Burroughs, bilingual poetry reading will take place. Rosa Alice Granko will read her poem in Portuguese and her translator Alexis Levity at SUNY will read in English. Okay, so now Bob Edwards will introduce us today's distinguished and lively speaker. Right. Oh, right. Right. Oh. It's, a, it's a great pleasure to introduce Rose Jolly this afternoon and to thank her for giving today's comparative literature luncheon talk. Rose came to Penn State from Queen's University in 2013 as the Weiss Chair in the Humanities. Uh, and promptly changed the title uh, to the Weiss Chair in Human Rights and Literature. Uh, we should have seen something good coming there already. But uh, what she saw in the appointment here, I think, was an opportunity to foreground interdisciplinary work and scholarly collaboration. Trained in African literature and postcolonial theory, she is the author of Colonization, Violence, and Narration and Cultured Violence, as well as an essay collection co-edited with Derek Adridge on South African writing uh, in the crucial period 1970 to 1995. The intellectual and ethical investments of these works of literary scholarship manifest themselves and branch out now in current projects on human rights, medical humanities, the representation of trauma and uh, HIV AIDS, and environmental concerns with fracking. Moving humanities research into the public sphere, Rose has worked hard to build collaborations and communities that will sustain projects of this ambition. And behind the visible dimension of organizing shared research, there has been working a book. Rose has just finished writing Affluent Communities a book that aims to rethink the ways that we understand the connections between human rights and literature. Her talk today is from a portion of the new book, so we get to hear it fresh. Please welcome Rosemary Shaw. everybody for coming. I really, really appreciate it, especially at this time of the year when I'm sure everybody has exhaustion. I hope you can see me over this podium. Being five foot nothing has its disadvantages. Okay. So <clears throat> in this book, I'm arguing, um, building on some arguments that have already been made. Um, Joey Slaughter's book on human rights points out how limited the notion of the human is and relates it to the figure of um, the protagonist of the Bildungsroman. But I'm also weighing very heavily on um, black feminist theory such as Sylvia Winter. So she argues that the genre of the human, comma, man, 
is the difficulty and that that genre is the one in which human rights are written and the one that we understand to be associated with the subject. And the concentration of my book is on um, basically trying to displace that subject. To put it in a very simple way, I argue that human rights are completely inadequate to the idea of right human living. And so, for example, human rights says that sh there should be at least access to health. It's very difficult to access health if your environment is already degraded by fracking. So you can't access something that you don't already have unless you move. Um, and so there's that kind of way in which I'm arguing that the center or the, the, the co-constitutive subject of human rights is actually, quite properly speaking, not the human, but the human co-constituted with what in English we call the environment, co-constituted with both man-made and, um, and natural, um, uh, what, we call inverted, uh, what we call natural in English, um, uh, natural environments. And uh, the problem here being that, of course, post-Enlightenment English has a big problem with, um, with having embedded in it Cartesian ideals of the subject-object, which make it very messy to try to speak about the kind of uh, interconstituted and mutually constituted subject that I'm talking about. So <clears throat> in this chapter, I have to thank two people, Alex, who made me keep in a section of the actual published piece in Social Dynamics <coughs> called um, uh, Pathological Postcolonialism. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to talk about that here today, and I also want to thank Khabib Badaru, who really encouraged me to write the last section, which I am going to, 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 to speak about with you. So, in the context of this book, I'm going to speak today about African humanism and its afterlives. What precedes this in this chapter is a piece on the inadequacy, amongst other things, of Judith Butler's notions of precarity and breathability to the kind of subject that I'm talking about. So effluence that I'm arguing for is very, very different from a Butlerian um, disposability and breathability. And please feel free to ask me that about that at another time. OK. so. Humanism contains within it two characteristic aspects, one consonant with Eurocentric humanism post-enlightenment and one that pulls away from that tradition. The first is the idea of the centrality of the, and survivability of the human. The second is African humanism's attempt to reference long-standing African animist traditions of vast variety within the notion of human being living in harmony with his environment. Now, I should point out that it's always translated in his, but now in sub-South African um, languages, both the Bantu and the Sutu group, there's no pronoun marker for gender. So they're always translated by he, but this is a function of the translation. It's not in the original. Okay. Um, the latter is intended to indicate, if only summarily enough, not to draw the exoticizing attention of European anthropological gazes, the widespread sub-Saharan African belief in the unborn, the living, and the ancestors as simultaneous populations. And I acknowledge that there are um, South American and Aboriginal Australian um, cultures that have similar belief trajectories. The unborn are those who have yet to live, but because they have yet to live, they have not, are not yet to be grieved, even if the neoliberal post-colonial state's inherited genre of human rights regards them as immaterial. Simultaneously, the ancestors are the advisors, those who point out when life is not being lived by the living in harmony socially or environmentally, and who have, be, have to be appeased for such harmonious living to be, indeed be accomplished. The unborn and the ancestors are not citizens, but they are subjects who are the focus of hopes, anxieties, and yes, of grievability, and they themselves grieve, which is not something that a Butlerian grievability would allow. Despite their category as immaterial to effluent of the genre of the human. As categories of the effluent, they form a model of persistence in the face of the reduction of meaning perpetrated on the human by the categories of the citizen, the human who commands rights, the owner. Grievability does not need to be defined by the boundaries of the state to both exist and have effects. 
Let me ground these movements through a reading of one of African humanists' most illustrious proponents. Uh, I'm not an illustrious worker of the computer. Um, this is Zeke, is Eskia Zeke Impachlele. Impachlele, in part due to his deep understanding that a discursive move under apartheid to associate the white with the inhumane as both a political and aesthetic act would merely rehearse in a reversal of polls, post enlightenment's assignation of negative value to the black, rejects negritude, along with most famously Wally Shoyinka, in favor of what seems like universal humanism under the title of African humanism. Quote, there's a kind of piety also on my side that says to me, no matter what human beings will survive, no matter what human beings will survive, and there is something intrinsic in the human species to survive. End quote. When asked at the same time about the meaning of African humanism, Impashlele talks persuasively about the deep-seated belief of sub-Saharan Africans in the wisdom of the elders and the company of the ancestors. He also remarks upon and encourages the tradition of, okay, so this is burying the afterbirth. So you take the afterbirth and you bury it in the compound of the mother to show the cyclar, cyclar, <coughs> sorry, circularity of the unborn, the living, and the ancestral subjects. And, the, 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 uh, and that would include, like, obviously, the, <coughs> the tie, as well as the placenta, okay, the cord. So the placenta represents a unique conjunction of the unborn, the born, and tribute to its ancestors in the very ritual of burial. In Prashlela addresses embodiment through the buried afterbirth, a metonymical part of the co-constituted effluent subject, unborn living ancestors. Now these effluent subjects produce huge problems for English, so what I do is I put hyphens in them to show that it's one subject, okay. unborn living ancestors. However, the very relation between African and European humanism is set in tension by the remarks with which he comments on this afterbirth tradition. Okay. One can perhaps see the addition of the ancestors to the notion of enduring humanism as that which makes Impachlele's humanism African. But to do so would be simplistic in implying that all one needs for an a African humanism is a substitution of African ontologies of being for the enlightenment human intelligence or epistemology. <coughs> However, what Impachlele says in detail is this. I should also say that in African humanism, there is no dichotomy between the material world and the spiritual world. So no Cartesians, but there is a continuity reinforced by interrelationships and interconnectedness. That is, animal life, plant life, and inanimate objects have a life of their own which is part of us. What Ipachlele then goes on to describe could be termed rituals, but only in the sense in which ritual is understood not as an act fixed in the non-ending and non-changing time of the again and other, that is, the African subject of pre-1960s anthropology, but a set of practices that dramatize the interrelatedness of inanimate materials, nature, animal and plant life, and human animals themselves. Quote, in Pachele again, which is why, for instance, a traditional healer will use, here he's talking about a sangoma, not an inyanga, will use organic matter to heal the body. It will be something plucked from nature because there is a unity. Part of the continuity is also dramatized by the way in which women will take their afterbirth and bury it in the vicinity of the crawl, because it symbolizes reincarnation, the cyclical pattern of existence. One could see in Impachlele's African humanism a kind of survivalist anthropocentrism with an African twist, that twist being the emphatically not European Christian reincarnation and or the specifically not Western continuity between the unborn, the living, and the ancestors. However, this would be to overlook the important point at which Impachlele sounds like a cross between a definitively European new materialist and a post-humanist. It's all right, I'll get over the ists in a minute. Animal life, plant life, and inanimate objects, he says, have a life of their own which is part of us. The conflict between the term inanimate objects and the phrase have a life of their own okay, speaks precisely to that which cannot be spoken in English without making the language work against its historical episteme. In the same interview, Impachlele expresses a desire to write a novel tentatively entitled And the Birds Flew Away, about two neighbors feuding and the weaver birds who live in the vicinity. 
The weaver birds have a typical mythology, he, he says, indifferent but almost as if they were aware of what is happening of the conflict. But one winter time, shall I say one autumn time, they take off, they're gone, end quote. In Pashtelian, it pains to point out that this is not some pathetic fallacy, some projection onto nature by the human intellect. What bothers me here is, he says, how can I convince anybody that this is not the intellect projecting itself into a situation where the relationship between animal life and African life, or human life, shall I say, is thus interwoven. So he's really worried that he's trying to do this, but he knows it's going to be read as pathetic fallacy. There is a strain of melancholy in Impachlela's work, as Richard Sam in the interviewer here notes, which highlights, uh, he highlights to Impachlela himself. But this strain of melancholy is not because the birds fly away, if one may build on Impachlele's perspective narrative, but because the birds that fly away are no longer able to do anything but witness human experience, as humans have lost the ability to be in relationship with the birds through the imposition of capitalist modernity. They, he says, Impachlele says, the weaver birds, are now indifferent to human behavior, whereas in earlier days we were all interlinked, we had a sense of interconnectedness with animal life. End quote. If there is a grievability here, and I would argue there is, it is not about the migration of the weaver birds, which you need to know that's a cyclical migration okay, of the weaver birds, um, but the loss of an African humanist capacity to be in relation with the weaver birds. The need for this excess or effluence is that which is unspeakable, and I'm saying it's unspeakable because it's difficult to speak in English, and obviously Impatlele has its own concerns about how this narrative would be received within a certain kind of genre of the human that Silver Winter talks about, which he doesn't want it to be read in, obviously. This need for the excess or effluence is that which is unspeakable to indeed be spoken in English is perhaps the root cause of melancholy in Impatriele's work, bearing in mind that under apartheid you had to write in English in order to avoid the construction of the native languages as tribal by the apartheid government. So there were very strong imperatives to use English as a lingua franca. <coughs> While Garuba, Harry Garuba, has argued for materialist animism as a metaphorical ability of several literatures, including the work of Wally Schwenker as a primary example, uh, to express what I would call the animist uh, element of effluence, I do not think Garuba's materialism fixes in Pachlele's conundrum. I argue with Barad that it is the post-Cartesian inability of English in practice to render matter and spirit simultaneous <coughs> upon which Impachlele's, sorry, Impachlele's melancholy rests. It is also to be noted, as Kim has done, that in the formulation of matter and spirit is the black body in particular that comes to represent the denigrated matter as opposed to the lofty spirit of the white human. English is not a neutral medium in which the Cartesian imaginary and the effluent imaginary may meet on equal terms. However, effluence presides a pathway for grieving what Cartesian, Cartesianism regards as waste. Okay, this is a key point, I'll just say it again. However, effluence provides a pathway for grieving what Cartesianism regards as waste. The emphasis in Pachlele puts on the burial of the afterbirth is posed by Salmon in the question, not flippant, of what happens to the tradition of burying the placenta in the compound when one is no longer in the rural areas, but say for example in Soweto or somewhere where you start digging up people's gardens and putting afterbirth in them and they get upset. Okay. In Pachlele re responds that he sees the uh, interruption of the tradition of midwifery and burial of the afterbirth in, in the modernization that these women get to giving birth in clinics and hospitals negatively. Now this is kind of interesting because the rates, unless you have a problematic pre uh, pregnancy, you really, 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 and, and a deeply problematic pregnancy because the midwives, the traditional midwives are pretty good. You really want to stay away from hospitals. But I don't think Impachlele knew that, okay, but he's arguing for the burial of the afterbirth with its insistence on the inevitability of death and the notion of the appropriate place for the ancestors as being with the material earth, okay. And that's the link that he's really arguing for. Um, okay, so let me start here. So uh, this linchpin, I think, is what I noted earlier in Impachlele's work, is a key to comprehending the grievability of human effluence, or how human effluence itself need not be grieved into melancholy if it is attended to appropriately. Okay, and that's, you know, as much as I 
argue with Freud. I'm just going to use that as a shortcut right now. So I'm arguing that effluence itself need not be grieved into melancholy if the appropriate rituals and views are taking place. Impartiality suggests that grief is attended to appropriately if the rituals that maintain proper relations between the unborn, the living, and the ancestors are properly undertaken and understood. How is this to be done? In the specific context of the grievability we face less than a decade after someone's interview with Mpashlele, namely that which accompanies the HIV AIDS epidemic in South Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. What would a respectful yet non-anthropocentric or animist approach to grieving the effluent body in community of the HIV sufferer look like? What kind of internet connection between inanimate material, animal life, and plant life may be entailed in grieving HIV-related death in sub-Saharan African context? That includes, but is, not but is not confined to, the HIV victim as the citizen who bears the right to highly active and to retroviral treatment, hereafter I call it heart because it's just so long, um, and related human rights. What or who is the subject in excess of her rights? How do we grieve the effluent subject? We can ask this question without jumping to the notion that these deaths are of subjects without claims to rights. In that case, the deaths would be seen as natural or inevitable and thus ungrievable. In the case of African AIDS, this approach justifiably invokes accusations of racism and resurrects the category of African as one of appropriate ungrievability in the sense of Hegelian racism. In other words, it's just a racist approach. The AIDS epidemic raises the question of how we might locate grievability in the face of overwhelming death, where such grievability does not depend on state recognition for legitimacy of subjects with which the state may not know of which the state may not know, and indeed about which it may, it does not care, certainly under um, the Tabo and Becky regime. So this is the last section. Grieving an effluent community, the AIDS, sorry, this is very bizarre, but bear with me. The AIDS and daylily and chicken suffering, dying and dead as co-constituted subjects. So what I'm talking about is one subject, which is AIDS and daylily and chicken suffering, dying and dead. Okay, sounds absolutely Monty Python, but just bear with me. <coughs> In July 2004, the Etiquani, that's Durban metropolitan area, cemeteries department determined it would need an additional 12 hectares each year to accommodate the increased burial rate driven by the HIV epidemic. Of particular concern was identifying the land in Kwamashu and Omlazi, those are the townships, the informal settlements, where the majority of residents live and die. In 2013, the competition between land for development and land for burial became acute. Itikweni Parks, Recreation and Culture Head, Tembinkwazi Nkobo, stated at the South African Cemetery, sorry, Cemeteries Association Conference, who knew there was a South African Cemeteries Association conference, that land used for burial cannot legally be used for anything else, and that burial grounds cannot be established within 50 meters of water sources, and the appropriate infrastructure has to be built according to environmental assessments. So this is, at one point, we were burying bodies in uh, the communities. We were burying bodies <coughs> in cardboard boxes, and I had to go into rural KwaZulu-Natal, I'll show you where, and work with the chiefs to make sure that the water could be resurrected as safe because there was seepage between the bodies and the water supply. This is what happens when you have that many dead. Despite Kauteng having the largest population in South Africa, in 2010, KZN's registered deaths exceeded those of Kauteng, with the largest number of deaths taking place in Etekweni at Durban. During 2003 to 2011, burial, burials showed a gradual decline in Durban, but the municipal cemeteries manager in 2013, Pepe Das, pointed out that numerous staff had been dismissed because basically they had taken money on the side to authorize burials. Because of the respect for the dead and the traditional demands of the living to take care of ancestors' graves in relationships of mutual protection, the majority of the <coughs> population of KZN do not view cremation as acceptable. In the case of unapproved and inappropriate burial sites, as well as inappropriate coffin materials, bodily fluids escape the grave and contaminate water sources. In 2010, the New Orleans, East Newlands burial ground became such a heavy source of coffin flies, 
in the area that it was later closed down after heavier use of pesticides and other measures failed to control the proliferation, sorry, I have a sense of humor about this, of proliferation of coffin flies in the surrounding neighborhood. Now, coffin flies, it's just any fly in, like if you watch those, you know, like uh, forensic shows, it's which fly, sh you know, shows up first. It's all of those, okay? They don't only feed on dead bodies, they do fruit, they're not fussy, but like, a selection of dead bodies is young, young. Right? Okay. In 2015, Etta hypothesized the fact that after 10 years, if leases on graves were not renewed, those graves would be reused. Most religious leaders responded with horror, but the head of parks, leisure, cemeteries, and recreation argued that the practice could not be entirely new, as approximately 1.5 million bodies are currently buried in approximately half a million graves in 65 cemeteries in Etta Arguably, the most vociferous of the objections came from the KZN, uh, I'm not Kwasi and Kwasi. This is the guy who's elected by the traditional chiefs as the chief of the chiefs, is the best way to say it. So in Kwasi, um, Pati Sizwe, Chiliza, arguing, Isi Zulu culture does not allow the practice. Quote, in our culture, we respect graves. Once a person has passed away, we respect that person and we can't do anything to remove the grave except to discuss with the family. If my father died today, even in 10 years, I will go and pay respects to my father at his grave, and even my child will go there to respect his grandfather. If you bury someone <coughs> with my father, what is that? Rural areas are under no less pressure. In 2005, farm dwellers living on white-owned farms in KZN received the right to be buried on those farms. There had been tension over this issue. Okay. So because of land transfer issues in KwaZulu-Natal, the white farmers were trying not to have blacks buried on the farm because the blacks might then later lay a claim to that land. Okay. Um, and of course, this is a very, very big problem because most rural burials take place in the family compounds, no matter where the family compound is. Okay, however, concern about appropriate burial as it is framed by the Nkosi Amakosi assumes that there is a family to grieve the dead. From 2003 to 2013, I did field research and intervention work on a regular basis at St. Paul and Norris Hospital, Centre Cal, a district hospital. Let me see if I can do this for you. Okay, <clears throat> so I don't have one of those fancy pointer things, but this is the district I was working in. Durban is Itikweni, right there. Okay. This is the Centre Cal mission that I was working at, along with some Polonaris Hospital. They've got the road from Durban done that way, but you can also go a prettier route. It's just long. Okay. So it's quite far in next to Lesotho then, in the Fruitlands. Okay. <coughs> I did field research and intervention work at Centre Polonaris Hospital, Centre Cowra District Hospital, of 155 beds, about 20 minutes from the white farming settlement of Crichton. Um, on one occasion, as we were giving a workshop on gender rights under the Constitution to hospital workers, my peripheral vision was often disturbed by what I would a second later recognize as gurneys coming down the open air cement ramps from the upper floor of the hospital. These gurneys had bodies on them, many of them being taken to the incinerator, which was the case if bodies were not claimed for burial. We could see the flame from the incinerator burning incessantly most days we worked there. In the course of a 1.5 hour workshop, about 12 bodies were taken out in this manner. The ramp, the ramp became known to my team colloquially as Kadava Way. I think I have a picture of Kadava Way. No? You went past you did. it. Yeah. Did I go past no. it? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not very okay. good at these. There. there. Yeah, okay, so this is Kadava Way. So this is very typical in rural hospitals because it, it's warm, so there's no need to actually have it built inside or anything. So this is the, the roundabout that you take the gurneys down. And I was giving the workshop in this area, which is um, where you do food and have meetings or whatever. The main part of the hospital is on the right. Okay. Um, the ramp became known to us colloquially on the project as Kadava Way. We were not disrespectful, we were coping. One day I was asked to meet with a young girl whose mother had just died. The mother, uh, so the mother had AIDS. Well, you can't really, I mean, you die of co she always died of co-infections of other STIs, basically. She left behind this daughter whom I guess taking malnutrition into account to be anywhere between eight and 11. Although I can't, you know, malnutrition, you can't really tell. 
The nurses were very embarrassed by the girl's behavior. After her mother died, she kept on flipping up her skirt to strangers in the hospital on the ward, and she had no underwear, poverty, right? They had no idea of, quote unquote, what to do with her until care was found. I tried to explain to them that, in my view, she was seeking attention in the wake of her mother's death as best she knew how, which is why the nurses telling her to stop was not working. I also convinced them that the most urgent act was uh, not to find her underwear, but to get, in, get her working with the nurses to fold, or the nurses' aides to fold laundry and so on. But at any event, to keep her focused on a task with a companion. At this point, I was completely focused on the challenge myself and not at all concerned about my own coherence in the scenario. I had not yet addressed the question of how I stood as a griever in relation to effluent subjects. Later that day, I stumbled down the hill between Stap St. Paul and Iris, we used to call it Stapis for sure, and the Centre Cal Mission, and was faced with a compound outside of which a chicken was tied up in 40 degrees Celsius heat, obviously on hand to be slaughtered in the next few days as it was Christmas week. The chicken was dying of heat exposure. I had no energy nor the appropriate authority to do anything for the chicken, but I sat down and cried inconsolably in the Land Cruiser in the back seat with my head down so nobody would see me. I have no idea how long I was there, nor did I know what I was crying for, a subject that in retrospect I identify as the effluent communi community of mother, orphan, dying, Dalen. Sounds bizarre, bear with me. Then I got up, let in a number of women seeking a lift to the closest transport stop on my way to Ecopo, and drove back to the project depth. One day I saw Father Ignatius in a similar state. Okay. Father Ignatius is the priest of the Centre Cal Mission who attends every death at the hospital that he can, regardless of patient's religious affiliation. Um, that means he was going up like a million times a day in the period that I'm talking about. He teaches the community boys football and soothes his soul by growing day lilies in the most extraordinary burst of colors ever to be found in the Santa Cal Valley. He used to do orchids, but those ended up to be too difficult to tend in the climate of the district. It's too uh, uh, moist. Himera colors or day lily is called as such because each bloom lasts only a day. Escape carries many blooms that open in succession, but each bloom itself is a one day wonder. Father Ignatius was just a few months away from his sabbatical in his native colon, but was collapsing in view of his finishing line. I sat as he told me a number of broken up stories, all about how deaths had ravaged through the families he knew and did not know. He kept repeating that these were all good people. He could not stop weep weeping from the most enormous set of us blue eyes I have ever seen. Ignatius is very thin and he has dark hair, which makes the blue eyes seem more, even more dominant on his visage than would otherwise be the case. Nothing to do with this, but you haven't heard anything till you've heard somebody speak Zulu with a poet, Polish accent. It's bizarre, as these priests do. I listened until he had no more energy to talk. We sat looking at the day lilies for a while, so I'll just try, I think I put the day lilies in there. That's Ignatius at work. It's very difficult to get pictures of him. He, he won't have his picture taken when he's, you know, just being him, so I'm afraid that's a, a blessing. And those are the day lilies. He calls them his ladies. Um, we sat looking at the day lilies for a while and they looked back at us. Then we went our separate ways back to what I call coping life, which is not quite the same as coping with life. Once again, we were finding ways to grieve the deaths of subjects no one had claimed as meaningful, grievable, or in any way important in the first instance. Father Ignatius Stankovic, returned from his sabbatical, is still at the Centre Carl Mission, which celebrated its 125-year jubilee in 2013. When anyone asks me about the hardest moments of those years before the widespread rollout of heart, highly active antiretroviral uh, retroviral therapy, and its beneficial effects were anywhere in evidence, I'm embarrassed to say I just shake my head and change topics. How do you explain that your worst moment was a chicken die of dehydration in a Christmas compound, or when a frog snuck into your computer bag at night to keep warm and you didn't know in the next day she or he was the soft squish you put your computer onto and you couldn't stop breathing? The clinical way of explaining this, as I know perfectly well, is that the non-human animal suffering is a trigger for the grief of all the dying and suffering and human deaths we witness. But I don't think that is what it is too. If the bodies of the human animals and the bodies of the chicken yet to die and the frog already dead inspire grievability in me, this is certainly not a grievability the South African state would countenance, 
nor yet empathize with. African bodies have been too long rendered as mere animals would be the predictable response. Why would you dream of repeating the racist paradigm of the black body as patently non-human and animal instead? A correlative response would be, why would you pathologize the otherness of the HIV-positive black body through its association with animalization? The problem here for the Cartesian mind is that many of us who worked in and through the height of the epidemic prior to widespread heart rollout, so heart rollout in South Africa was 2003, but actual rollout in the rural <coughs> districts took until 2010 to fully come into being. Many of us who worked in, through the height of the epidemic prior to heart rollout developed an intimacy with the almost dead and dead bodies so that our grief was not dependent on or did not change if the person was visibly dying or dead, a he, a she, a they, or an it. Once I was in Itoko with a colleague to visit the district health officer. We were waiting in the land cruiser until the December thunderstorm let up for a bit. We saw two men get out of a tiny bucky. This is now like the tiniest Hyundai truck that looks like one of those like matchbox trucks. You know? um, they seem to be carrying something very slight between them, we, a sheet or a blanket, something very two-dimensional. At first we thought it might be a piece of glass. It was almost as tall as they were, but not quite. It wasn't glass then because they were lined up in parallel. A man, the thing, and another man with this narrow thing between them. Once they came a meter or two closer, we realized it was a very sick man between them. So sick, in fact, that he was barely there, like a slip of a man, one slip, and you wouldn't have known he had been there. We sat shocked to the core that there could be so little difference between the barely living and the dead. Later, we came more and more used to this weird fact that near deathness or death made no difference to the grief. It just felt slightly, I don't know, sacred maybe, to witness a being between death and life, and then also a being between death and whatever death means to the being that is dead. Person, chicken, frog, even day lily, they were becoming different, ancestors bearing witness to us, and we were flailing about trying to cope live. We thought we were bearing witness to them, but somehow each time they seemed to be grieving for our inability to make our joy and our grief inadequate to their being. We were always struggling to exceed our own grief to pay them the respect they properly commanded. Our grief was all about us. So I began to think about these effluent bodies, unclaimed humans, almost dead chicken, dead frog, daily dying on its one day of glory. Not as subjects for the elegy, but as subjects in excess of their rights. The human to full citizenship, antiretrovirals, victims of failing social and economic networks of support, becoming differentially exposed to injury, violence, and death. This is, you know, um, Butler doing a thing. And I'm trying to think of subjects in excess of this. The frog is one who one should not mourn as much as the human, I'm starting now to question. The chicken is always already disposable. The daylily is built for what we might call natural disposability because the, the, the daylily dies, it only lives one day, right? What in Pachlele might ask us, can we hear these beings say? Can we listen? Can grievability be a listening? Can grievability be anything other than a bearing witness? Is there a way of modeling effluent grief where there are no families to undertake extra anthropocentric rituals? Firstly, I will wrap up as soon as I can here. Many of the people whose bodies remained unclaimed at Sentika were always living without networks of social and economic support. One can think about this as people living in the cracks the state leaves open in a metaphorical road, only in rural KwaZulu Natal, there are more cracks than roads. Um, further, these effluent bodies prove that the recognizable grievability of the state or the person as conceived of in Butler's form formulation may capture the experience of grievability from an anthropocentric viewpoint, but not from the perspective of what we might call a latter-day African humanist, humanist, a descendant of Impachele's narrative. For what is the unborn but precisely something that is most categorically of life, just as that which is dead is not not of life, but an ancestor. Okay. Um, so then I go into a discussion about Stephanie no Nolan, but I'm going to leave this behind. She could never understand me when she kept on saying, why are people so... Um, she seemed to think that people were almost grieving too much about AIDS. And I kept on saying to her, it's because if you understand the AIDS deaths in South Africa, it's not the deaths of individuals, it's a death of a cosmology. Because you can't understand why so many young people are dying before they have the wisdom to become ancestors. So that's what actually needs to be grieved, not just the individual bodies. But trying to get Stephanie to understand that was not a going thing. Okay. So I'm going to finish here. 
But the effluent body speaks. Sometimes it yells through the unseemliness of its effluence, as when it pushes away a computer from its absurd froggy dignity, or brings down a plague of coffee flies on those who ignore it, or permeates the air of the valley with the smell of burning flesh from the incinerator, or resounds with its claims to beauty of the day on its death, of its death, with the human and non-human animal death all around it. This is like the daily. If we don't listen, that's not yet another responsibility of the FUNB. It's our responsibility. And in relinquishing such listening, we give up material forms of persistence. We give up whole realms of desire that can and do resist their condemnation as effluent, toxic, a kind of metonymical necrophilia. Indeed, waste and waste of time. Mourning, desire, and beauty are the language in which the desired and desiring dead speak to us. This is not an exotic call to action, but a quotidian exchange of extra anthropocentric beings and the rightness of such being. Its value is unspeakable within the current genre of the human, but lies in the imaginative reordering of human rightness that would render visible conventional genres of the human and their constructions of disposability not only as profoundly wasteful, but indeed even as toxic to non-anthropocentric human rightness. So let me just, uh, that's Stappies, right? That's um, somebody who is being grieved, okay? That's a funeral. Many a day I've seen one of those coffins on the top of those little Hyundai Bucky's and as it goes along the road to Centacal, there's so many curves that you're sort of waiting for the, it kind of becomes this joke, right? Because the top of the coffin might just like slip off the side of the truck at any time. And that's the incinerator. So not to be ignored. Uh, I have two questions. One you're probably expecting, one maybe less so. Uh, one, you know, uh, I was wondering if you could talk about uh, how your approach to the um, kind of co-constituted subject of the chicken and the flowers. The dead that. Yeah, how that how that approach differs from a kind of um, new materialist assemblage. Oh, that's the first chapter. Mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Uh, which is something we've been, you know, we've been talking about a lot. Yeah. Uh, so I, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I'll give you my second question as well, which is, you know, I've just been rereading the novel uh, *A Burnt Out Case* by yes. Graham Greene, right? Which is about uh, it, yeah. a leper colony in in the Congo. Uh, and one of the interesting things about that is that the the carers, the who are mostly either doctors or um, uh, priests, become kind of weirdly dependent upon. Uh, the lepers to the point that some of them are disappointed about the arrival of a cure yeah. for, for, for leprosy, right? So, and that, you know, that's a really kind of interesting dynamic that kind of plays into what you're talking about with the hospital. And I was wondering whether there's a kind of practical application of what you're talking about for rethinking kind of care of patient relationships. So I'll just ask the first one quickly. I have a long piece in the introduction that explains why I think new materialism is vaguely toxic. But let me, um, I think that I find new, new materialism very disturbing. And this is because there's no understanding in new materialism of the kind of, I, I, would, I would put Mel Chen in a different order. <coughs> But there's no understanding in somebody like Jane Bennett, uh, not Jane, yeah, it is Jane Bennett, right? Mm -hmm. What's the character of a Jane Bennett? Yeah. Jane Bennett, um, about the fact that, yeah, of course you're trying to think the object differently. You've been living alongside animist cultures for 400 years, and now Western culture is suddenly be beginning to discover its own belly button. You know what I mean? Like, oh my God, we made the Cartesian split, now we have to re be knitted to get together subject and object. And I'm not saying that that doesn't affect colonized communities through the practice of colonization, but I'm very bothered about the fact that there isn't an understanding that this is not the primary crisis for animist communities. So this is why I'm, I'm not interested in that particular perspective and, and in fact quite hostile to new materialism in that form. The second piece, I mean, which I wouldn't have a problem with if it would just acknowledge its precursors. I mean, not the Spinoza, Deleuze, Guattari precursors. I mean, like, ah, oh, you've been living with animist communities for 400 years after colonizing them, maybe you're picking up something. A bit late, but you could try. 
Um, the second piece I think is really interesting, which is that um, I think that there is a kind of urgency and a kind of, when you do the kind of work that I did, there's a kind of urgency and a kind of addictiveness to the adrenaline that goes along with it, which I actually don't think is about the object, the, the supposed sick object, or in my terms, the co-constituted subject at all. It's about, it's, it would be represented by me saying we thought it was all about ourselves. Do you see what I'm saying? And that's where the the turn has to happen because there was like people, people there were people who were like almost bizarrely rejoicing that ARV heart took so long to roll out in the rural areas because oh my god what if we become <coughs> indispensable you know what I mean? so I do think that there is a very practical application and it's it's about that the patient is not the object that sustains the subject if that makes sense, it's a very practical application. And it's also about not exoticizing the experience. There's sometimes when you wanted people to die because they were struggling so hard. You know? And so the whole idea of, it's almost like the whole idea of keeping lepers alive because they justify what we're doing is a little bit like, you know, the poor will always be with us in brackets, thank God, right? Yeah. Um, thank you. That was fast, so I missed part of it because I listened slow, but no, that's good. Um, it's more I need to speed up my ears maybe. Um, but I was really interested in, in the, the material that you, were, you sort of um, lumped together under the rubric of the capacity to be in relation with. Yes. And that's where kind of all the hyphens were coming in. Yeah. Um, but the capacity to be in relation with, that capacity itself seems to be some of the hyphening, some of the glue that, yes. that right, um, congeals these, yeah. these otherwise potentially disparate subjects. Um, and at one point, and, and here's where I wasn't listening fast enough. Um, Sorry, it was. Here was, I wasn't listening fast enough. No, no, no. Um, were you talking about language? And so what I wanted to kind of ask you about was the role that Okay, so and you, you mentioned kind of the burial of the afterbirth and these kind of yeah. like physical, spatial, ritual types of things you can do. Um, but in terms of, of capacities to be in relation with that could be or that are um, negotiated through language um, were things that I didn't quite get. I'm not sure if that's somewhere else in the book. Um, I'm just, I think what I'm trying to point out is that Isisulu and Susutu are not... First of all, I would not say that any language is foundationally or essentially anything. So that's why I'm very careful to say post-Enlightenment English, because obviously Old English had no problem with these co-constitutive subjects. Anybody who's waded their way through the Old English poetry kind of knows that, right? So what I'm interested in is the ways in which colonization English, even when it tries to translate the big books that Einke Kroch is doing, um, doesn't have enough understanding to translate these subjects in ways that don't come down within a Cartesian imaginary. Whereas spoken Zulu doesn't actually do that. Um, so there's actually now a very strong distinction between um, Zulu and deep Zulu and what's called Zulu light, L-I-T-E. And deep Zulu is the one that people speak where I was working. And now what's really distressing is the kids in Durban who are training in medical school that I used to teach uh, there, I used to teach their um, rural medicine rotation. They can't actually, they have too, their Zulu is too light sometimes to, to actually um, communicate properly with their patients. Mm -hmm. And it's that Zulu light which wouldn't carry the non-Cartesian meaning. Is that what you were asking? Yeah. Yeah. So there's something that's dying out of the language. So Absolutely. In in the rural in the in the in the um, in the in the urban areas, absolutely. If there's a instrumentalization of the language that won't carry um, what the chief is saying about the dead. Thank you. Sorry, somebody don't know who's first. <laughs> okay. So I've got Karen and Vana in my Um I was Thank you for the talk, Rose. Uh, I was wondering, I had two questions. One is about whether you could talk more explicitly about the relationship of effluence to objection, 
because effluent seems to suggest that porosity between subject, object, animate and inanimate environment, but also leaking bodies, which seems pretty appropriate in this context. So is it a critique of objection? Is it a rejection of objection? How, how would you position it in relationship? The objection of objection, maybe, but I think, you know, objection comes from, and this is why I'm using the word waste, right? It's the Latin, abiaco, yacre, yaki, yaktum, which means to throw out, ne? to throw away from. So, um, what I'm interested in is how, when you live in these kinds of situations, you can't actually throw, you can't physically place yourself away from this waste. So then I started to think about these questions of how you live with, as opposed to how you, you abject, you know. So I don't even know if it's an abjection of abjection, because what I'm talking about with effluence, which I wouldn't expect people to understand from my incredibly quick piece, is the fact that um, effluence and extra anthropocentrism include the subject, the human subject, but not as it's constituted within the genre of the human. So the effluent piece is the flowing out. Okay, so I'm recapturing that leaking or flowing out as being actually essential to the human. Whereas what the genre of the human does is a strategy of containment. Does that make sense? So objection sounds like a logic that comes with the subject. Absolutely. And this I would argue yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and I don't think that feminist going against abjection is going to work. I think you have to go against the genre of the human big time, like Sylvia Winter. Otherwise, it's a partial sort of, you know, job. My second question is about genre. So how do you connect the genre of the human and the literary genre? Do you see some literary genres in, as more structurally uh, yes. Ad yes. <laughs> adapted to so provide a specific So one of the things I say in the book is that I think that Genre, one of the reasons why I had a hell of a time writing the book, I mean, apart from other pieces of my job interfering as they do and as they should, was that I realized that we so expect the human to be the category of recognition for the genre, and I'm trying to undo that, so how do I make sense? Like, every now and again, it just looks episodic to me, so I had to make a conscious statement about about methodology. So I would also say, of course, Joey Slaughter's already argued that the genre of the human is, he doesn't use one, he doesn't seem to have read Winter, but is the, the Bildungsroman. But I'm very careful to say that I think that poetry is probably the place that is uh, English poet in the Latin, in English, the poetry where it's, that's least obedient to the genre of the human is poetry. And maybe that's because of the, you know, uh, it's because of capitalism and the acceptance of the buildings from man and so on, and, and economies of exchange. Um, I was struck by so many things in your presentation, Rose, but there is one moment in particular I want to ask you about, and that is in your continuity between the unborn and the living and the ancestors. It seems as if time itself is continuous yes. and flowing and the term. But in the process of grieving, you mentioned at one moment that the death of so many young people was difficult because they had not had the opportunity to acquire the wisdom to become ancestors. So in the process of grieving for the very young, uh, is there a literary or an imaginative mechanism or opportunity or tradition yes. or genre yes. that enables the mourner to transform. And I'm thinking in particular of, you can't help make connections in terms of whatever is in your own head, mm -hmm. of a 14th century English poem called Pearl, which is probably oh, the Pearl one of the, yeah. Yes, exactly. Old fashioned University of Toronto exams, yeah, yeah, they've done that. Yeah. Yeah. I actually love the Pearl poem. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, ostensibly or perhaps literally about the death of a child at the age of approximately two who is then mourned and learned from in the persona of a grown young woman who possesses wisdom, not only the wisdom of the ancestors, but a spiritual, in that case, explicitly mm -hmm. Christian, mm -hmm. timeless kind of wisdom. Does that type of thing happen in the I think context what has of happened now in the rural, I mean, first of all, in the rural areas, it's very difficult because although 
as I say in the book, you don't, uh, AIDS is not an event, it's more like what you would call an English environment. So it becomes your second skin. So that means that there is an ability for the wise people to actually create a, a form of effluence between the unborn and the living and the ancestors, in which you start to see the, live, the ancestors as teaching the living something through the death of, of a whole number of very young children. So now the first way that one interprets that as a, as a wise person or sangoma is that there's something very wrong with the way that we're living. So disease is not seen as biological disease only. It's also a sign of um, society gone wrong on a massive level. So you have to then sit down and think about what's going wrong. Okay. So it's not that people completely reject cures, you know, Western cures. That would be very simplistic. People, what we call in medical sciences, dual use their belief systems. So absolutely they'll get, go get heart, but they'll also be trying to think of what has gone wrong. And one of the things that will then happen is that the living who are grand, okay, the, the very young are not so much the people who die, it's the, it's the parents. So you, you get left with grannies and grandchildren. And it took out that middle layer, which is very, very difficult for the older people, right? Because they suddenly are parenting at age, you know, between 65 and 80. Very, very difficult. So then one has to think about what is this, are the ancestors trying to point out that the living have to take on some more of the ancestral work? That the ancestors are not tired? You know, so there, there are ways of there being effluent categories between the unborn, the living, and the ancestors. So yes, there is an opportunity for that. But that's a huge, I mean, we can only start even speaking about that, you know, 15 years after not even, yeah, 15 years after the height of the academic, uh, epidemic, the height of the academic, <laughs> four years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Maggie, okay. sorry, I just <laughs> said your name. No, uh, um, so I wanted to ask you to uh, speak a little bit more about your site or the community in which you were working, um, precisely because one of the ways in which it was designated on the map was by mission. So, and also Father Ignatius is a sort of important yeah, yeah. figure when you move to the kind of narrative part of the story. And I, I find that interesting precisely because of the ways in which you signposted the concepts you're working with and through Contra, not just the Enlightenment, but also Christian notions of reincarnation yeah. came up. And what strikes me as so interesting about your site is not, is the presence of the church and then this simultaneity of different ontologies oh, or being that characterize yeah the precisely are actually what facilitate your argument, right? That it's not a sort of outside, but precisely the insturtices. Mm -hmm. I didn't say that correctly. Um, but I'd like you to talk a little bit more about the specificity of that overlap between um, communities and ontologies <coughs> that creates the sort of possibility for seeing what you're getting yeah, at. Yeah, I think that first of all, no, there are very few people that only like people are driven very much by community in these rural areas and so what Ignatius and actually the other guy who you saw in the picture Stanley who's now the Archbishop in the, of, of, of Ums and Kulu district have done is they're very very loose around the edges in a way that you know the former Pope not necessarily this one would not have accepted okay so um, there are a lot of people that love the church, that do everything, that entertain, you know, go with the church. But there are a lot of um, other religions, like the religion of the rocks that goes on um, uh, with it. And there are a lot of other traditions. So there's a huge history of what I was calling dual usage. Um, so people wouldn't see a huge conflict, for example, in going to confession, but at the same time going to the Sangoma. So there's not that... We might see it as a contradiction, but this is an enormously generative piece of it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and just to show this, you know, I remember, you know, um, Stanley, who's a very practical guy, saying, we put up a box of free condoms. <laughs> this is the Catholic Church providing condoms. Okay, let's not go there. Don't rat him out. He's a lovely, lovely man. We put up condoms, but the young people aren't taking them. But they're not on Catholic property. They're on the post office. Mm -hmm. So the, the church had to buy the post office building in order to not be in possession of the building as part of its mission to put up a condom stand. 
And then I had to go into the discussion that, you know, the young people don't like to use this like three millimeter wide condoms with no lubrication. You really need the sexy things. And he's like, how am I going to get those? And we're like, no problem, we'll get them for you. you know? So there's this like, <laughs> yeah, there's this like a complete understanding of what's going on at the same time as there's the, you know, and believe me, it's not always simple. So at one point I had to talk to the Amakosi about doing a workshop in a particular space, which is the community space, even though it's attached to the church. And so I got his permission and I held this workshop and then the Nkosi, who later on became a very good friend of mine, at the time was very hostile and called me in with all of his Isinduna, his men, his, his wise men, his counselors, they're called, and said, why are you making the women rude? <laughs> this is because what he meant for those of you who have some Zulu Shlonipa, shlo they lost Shlonipa respect, the practice of speaking with respect where you, you can't say your husband's name, you have to like do all this punning around your husband and your father-in-law's name and the family's name and mother-in-law. And um, it was because I was doing um, workshops on the Constitution and their, their rights under the Constitution, which are in complete conflict with some of the traditional traditional rights. And so then I went to Father Stanley, I said, why didn't you warn me? He said, the woman needed the workshop. I wasn't going to tell you. So he threw me to the wolves. He thought that was perfectly okay. So yeah, it's a very mixed up space. <laughs> no, I, yeah, and I think I, I'm, I suppose in a sense I'm asking you for for an adjective, right? So contradiction, I think you uh, sort of persuasively dis no, no, no. But I think you persuasively discarded yeah. the the kind of recourse to language of contradiction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, syncretism is an old-fashioned word, and and again, and I, I think what's so interesting about your talk is that you're actually getting the conceptual traction precisely from I don't know the mixed upness, the overlap. Yeah. I'm sort of searching in my own description of your and talk I for an adjective. Syncretism because that's just certain kinds of joys. Yeah. This is yeah. More like I have to think about that. I have to think about a word. I wouldn't use syncretism because I love Wilson Harris. Poor man died, what, just two weeks ago, three weeks ago. But, um, but, I, but I have to think about a word because it's not syncretism because it's all a lived set of practices which aren't seen as contradictory by the people living. It's also like a mall. I mean, I want an analog um, uh, metaphor, like something like multi-track recording. Or so this right, so the English, we, I mean, in medical discourse, we get at it through the terms of dual usage or multi-usage, mm -hmm. which I think is really helpful because it is a use, it's a practice, multi-practice, and there's, a, there's simultaneous multi-practices, which absolutely baffled the doctors. You know, because the, the Sangoma give out powerful enough medicine that when you're dealing with a pregnant mother, you actually have to uh, bring down their dose of nevirapine if they're dual using. So they do have, it actually has like pharmaceutical effects as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll think about that word. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again.